Well, thank you very much, Dean Salander. Uh, as uh, as uh, Gar said, I was uh, in the uh, with the Advisory Council uh, several years ago and got to know Garth uh, very well, and I can certainly uh, attest to a great selection that was made in, in, in uh, Garth being the dean of, of our school. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here at, uh, at my alma mater and the, and the GSB. Uh, in fact, I was a member of the first graduating class uh, back in 1967 when this built building first opened as the brand new Stanford Business School. <laughs> and it really makes you feel old that as, as you come back and see that the new school is, uh, is uh, uh, soon to be open. It is also ironic uh, that uh, early next year, as Garth mentioned, uh, just a few months from now, that I will retire from, from Wells Fargo, uh, 42 years after I first joined General Mills, having just graduated from the GSB. And uh, as again, as, as Garth mentioned, and, and uh, I hope that you all, uh, when you are contemplating your next career move, uh, uh, would uh, stay and, and be more flexible than I was, because it is true that when I was thinking of what to do upon graduation. I, I really did not know for sure what I wanted to do, but I was very certain of what I did not want to do. I was certain that I did not want to ever work for a bank or work in New York City. <laughs> and uh, a mere eight years later, uh, I became uh, an executive of Citibank at 53rd and Park Avenue. And so keep an open mind. Uh, <laughs> Uh, since I have been around uh, this business world a long time and about ready to hang it up, as, uh, as we used to say on the athletic field, what I thought I would do this afternoon is share some thoughts with you entitled, What Have I Learned Since Business School? I hope this does not cause you to quit school and ask for a tuition refund, however. <laughs> as you will soon hear, I am quite passionate about certain ideas that have worked for me over my business career and have not usually been an important element of the curriculum at leading graduate schools of business. I began experimenting with these ideas shortly after my first general management job in, in 1969 at General Mills, but I did not put all of these ideas into an actual marketplace test until I joined Norwest in Minneapolis back in uh, 1986 as uh, vice chairman and head of the banking group there. Uh, let me briefly summarize uh, our results from uh, 1986 to now. Our assets have grown from 20 billion to 1.3 trillion. Our net income from uh, 100 million to an estimate of uh, 12 billion dollars uh, this year uh, that uh, analysts are, pre are forecasting. Our market cap from, 100, uh, from 800 million to uh, 135 billion a compound rate of 25%. Uh, we had 15,000 team members back there. Back then, we have 282,000 today. We had 700 stores today. We have 10,000. Uh, uh, we have also uh, today rank as the 14th most admired company in 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 the Fortune magazine's annual survey, and Barron's magazine in the United States, and Barron's, Barron's magazine uh, uh, ranks as, as in the top 25 of the most respected companies in the world. Now, I mention these things only to demonstrate what I think is the power of some of the things that I have learned since business school. And uh, these quantitative and qualitative me measurements uh, uh, at least give an indication that there has uh, been some value to those ideas. Uh, I would also, uh, I also want to mention that I've had uh, the privilege of meeting uh, the faculty of this great school on many occasions and in, in many different ways uh, where I have spoken about what I thought uh, was important uh, and important changes that needed to be made uh, in the curriculum of all business schools. And I'm pleased to see that the changes that have been made by the GSB in the last uh, five or 10 years are very consistent uh, with some of the thoughts and ideas I'll convey to you today. What I learned at the GSB and in my engineering courses are, in terms of quantitative methods and finance, accounting, strategy, and marketing were obviously of great value and were very important uh, and I believe are very important to business success. But on the margin, they were not even in the same ballpark and important as the concepts of leadership, people as a competitive advantage, and what I would describe as management by culture. 
but I am getting a little ahead of myself. And, uh, and, and I want to uh, uh, mention that I think one of the values of the engineering background that I had, even though you should all uh, feel uh, good that uh, those of you who cross bridges, bridges at least, or work in tall uh, skyscrapers, that I was not a, a real engineer as such. I was an industrial engineer uh, at Stanford. Uh, and industrial engineering is really was a quantitative uh, application of business principles. Uh, in fact, many of the professors were in the, both at the business school and the industrial engineering department. And it was things like uh, uh, statistical analysis, quantitative business methods, operations research, production efficiency, computer science, and so on. We all did take the same uh, basic engineering courses of math, physics, and, and, and so forth. But while my liberal arts uh, classmates were playing volleyball in the afternoon, we engineers were in the lab uh, doing work, uh, when not on the baseball field, at least in my case. And although I never practiced as an engineer, I do think that the engineering background did significantly influence the process that uh, I use in making decisions. And that process does appear to be different from that of some, of some other large company CEOs. My engineering background influenced my extensive use of a deductive reasoning, the importance of analyzing data intelligently, the ability to ask relevant questions, to challenge uh, existing assumptions, and, and do sensitivity analysis uh, on the various alternatives that uh, could be modeled on what decision to make. In short, to thoroughly understand the quantitative elements and the risk versus reward aspects of the ultimate decision. But I also learned a lot outside the classroom, especially on the athletic field, and through actual business experience by making a lot of mistakes, but hopefully never making the same mistake twice, i.e. learning from one's mistakes. The most important things I have learned in my 42 years in business and 34 years in financial services is that success in the business world, especially in the world of financial services or other service companies, is less about brains at the 99% level and more about people development, motivation, coaching, leadership, teamwork, integrity, culture, community involvement, vision, values, and a broad understanding of a variety of business disciplines, especially interpersonal relations. Intelligence above the 99% level might even be inversely correlated with some of these attributes. GMAT scores just don't measure these skills. In today's business world, we need broad generalists to successfully run large and complex companies. We desperately need leaders. This is where sports comes in, at least for me. From the age of four through 21, I played some form of competitive athletics for two to three hours almost every day. Sports helped me to understand human nature, teamwork, and how emotions impact performance. Sports helped me to appreciate the value of personal discipline, physical conditioning, and the use of time. But perhaps most importantly, athletics introduced me to the power of interpersonal dynamics. I experienced, as I know many of you have, that teamwork and team spirit causes a group of individuals to perform well above, well above the level of their individual abilities. In basketball, for instance, it's not the five best players who become champions. It is the best five players who do so. So what does it take to be successful in business? Well, if I had to do it all over again, perhaps the MBA I received is not the best degree to lead a company to success, after all. Perhaps you should seek four very different degrees. First, get a degree in believing. Believe in the enormous talent of people. People at all levels of your organization. To, to receive a degree in believing, your dissertation must answer this question. Why do many people enter business being bright, well-educated, energetic, wanting to make a difference, and in a few years feel bored, ignored, unfulfilled, and unimportant. Why is that? Today's MBAs need a second degree in affirming. They must affirm their belief that almost everyone in any organization, profit or not for profit, wants to contribute, wants to do a good job. Receiving this degree requires that we treat everyone in our organization with respect as equals, as talented people, as important members of our team working together toward a common goal, regardless of rank, educational level, or compensation. 
Third, I would recommend a master's degree in MNF. That stands for motivation and fun. Yes, you heard correctly, fun. I know it may be surprising to you, but even bankers should have fun. <laughs> I define fun as working with people to help them get excited about what they're doing, help create an enjoyable work environment, have fun, and then recognize them publicly with great fanfare for a job well done. When people aren't having fun, when they're not recognized for outstanding performance, when no one says thanks, they do become disengaged and feel unimportant. Recognition, I believe, is on the margin more important than salaries, benefits, and bonuses because most all companies pay competitively. It is corporate America's most under utilize motivational too. Try thanking someone too much for a job well done. You can't do it. So you need a master's degree in believing, affirming, motivation, and fun, and then you need a doctorate. A doctorate in leadership, the most advanced and important degree possible. What is leadership? There are probably as many definitions as there are leaders. I, I'm sure many of you have your own. I define leadership as the act of establishing and communicating a vision of the future and the art of motivating others to align with and embrace that vision. Leaders enable people to do, great, to do uh, such great things that they believe they can, that they can continue doing them. Leaders take people from where they are to where they've never been. That's why leadership is the critical skill for sustainable business success. But great leaders give power to their teams. They do not monopolize it. You cannot share a vision unless you share the power to achieve it. Leaders don't point fingers, they point direction. They show the way by personal example. Now, I'm sure everyone here today is still familiar with Maslow's th uh, hierarchy of needs, which I did learn in both my engineering and MBA classes. It arranges individual needs in a pyramid, as you well know. Safety is at the bottom, moving up through food, shelter, and at the top, a feeling of self-worth. In the same way, I believe there's a pyramid of tools to lead any business to greatness. Uh, importantly, but at the bottom, there are the fundamentals of the business enterprise, the accounting, the computer literacy, literacy quantitative skills. You move up the pyramid to finance, manufacturing skills, uh, sales, marketing, and then to the top, empowering people, motivation, recognition, communication skills, and at the apex, leadership. The need for speed and adaptability in today's world leaves zero room, in my opinion, for dictatorship, centralized command and control, and in the worst sense of the word, hierarchy. Hierarchy assumes that the higher up you are, the better you are at making decisions. Here's a secret. Almost every person at Wells Fargo knows more about their specific work than I do. Tellers, assistance people, commercial bankers, store managers, you name it. They all know more about the needs of their customers. Because they know more, there's no need to waste time coming to me for a decision. Make the decision yourself and let me know what, what you've decided. If you think I can help you to make better decisions, I'm available to do so. I remember reading books in my MBA class that said the maximum number of people who should report to someone else to have what was called effective control was six to eight, but never more than 10. Baloney. It should be 15 to 20 at least, maybe even more. The more people who report to you, the better. It forces you to delegate, give responsibility, and not interfere. It allows others the satisfaction of running their own shows, show and being responsible for their own results. It also reduced layers between you and the customer. The truth is, I didn't run Wells Fargo. We have nearly 100 businesses, each with their own fully loaded profit and loss. We are very decentralized. The business heads are totally responsible for their businesses. They report to six group heads who are the CEOs for their group of businesses, and they should act more like coaches than bosses. My job was to select the best people to run those businesses and those groups. Let them do it, coach them so they learn even faster, and ensure we have a strong internal check and balance audit process that verifies that they are adhering to the principles and the policies that we've agreed upon. People at the top should above all be leaders. Quite often they, they act like managers. 
Managers administer. Leaders innovate. Managers rely on systems. Leaders rely on people. Managers need control. Leaders rely on trust. Managers work on getting things right. Leaders work on the right things. At Wells Fargo, we believe personal leadership is the key to success. We believe the answer to every problem, issue, or opportunity in our company is already known by some uh, person or team in the company. The leader only has to find that person, listen, and help affect the change. By the way, the people with the best answers are not always the people with the most stripes. True leaders do not demand loyalty. They create it. They use conflict among diverse points of view to enable the team to reach new insights. They exert influence by reinforcing values. At Wells Fargo, we manage these 100 different businesses spanning a wide geography across all of North America and internationally by sharing a corporate culture that people believe in and align with, not by command and control or hierarchy. A good leader inspires a team to have confidence in him or her. A great leader inspires a team to have confidence in themselves. This may surprise you. At Wells Fargo, our most important constituent is not our customer. customers. It's our people. Because our people have the greatest influence on our customers and how our customers perceive Wells Fargo. Our people influence the attitude of our customers more than anything uh, else. Our people are key to customer satisfaction and increasing market share. So my job as CEO the past 18, uh, 15 years it was really quite simple. Cause the organization to focus on customers. Recognize that the key to consistent bottom line growth is actually the top line revenue growth. Hire, retain, reward, and recognize the best people. Coach them to be effective leaders. Make sure they care. In selecting people, I don't care how much a person knows until I know how much they care. Give people the responsibility and accountability to run their own business. Encourage them to be active in their communities, to be leaders in their communities. Create, describe, and communicate the corporate culture, its vision and values. Make sure everyone is having some fun. Then just get out of their way and cheer as they receive, as they achieve consistent record-breaking industry-leading results. In short, what I learned on the athletic fields and from 40 plus years in business, in the business world, is that success is all about people, especially in financial services or other service businesses. At Wells Fargo, we call it people as a competitive advantage. Few, if any, of, of other large financial institutions really walk that talk. Our emphasis on people is the foundation of our company's culture, our growth, and our success. Because we are so de decentralized and rely for results on our individual business leaders, which number in the thousands, by the way, we manage the overall company by culture, shared vision and values, and coaching. Incidentally, I don't remember these concepts uh, ever being presented, let alone taught, when I was at the Stanford Business School. So what I would now like to do is give you some examples of how culture influences our behavior and decision-making process. I believe these examples apply to all businesses, but again, in particular, those that have a direct service relationship uh, with uh, their customers. Um, take acquisition strategy, for example. At Wells Fargo, we will only do those acquisitions where the where the company that we are considering acquiring has a culture that is similar to Wells Fargo's. Our culture is described in this vision and values booklet that, has been, uh, that is updated about every two years and was first published about 20 years ago. It describes in great detail our vision, values, culture, and operating philosophy. If any one of you is interested in a copy of this, I, I have a, a few of them uh, here. Um, so early on in the discussion, discussion uh, uh, stage of a possible acquisition, we will give the, uh, the principals this booklet and ask them to compare their culture to ours. We ask them to estimate how well such a vision and values would be accepted. If the cultures are considered to be incompatible, we would terminate further discussions. A prime example of the role of culture in our acquisition decision-making process was, was when other large banks were buying investment banks in the late 1990s. We did not. We felt that the investment banking culture was incompatible with ours. 
Uh, we are a relationship-focused company. Investment banks are often transactionally focused. We are a team-focused company with team incentives. Investment banks are often made up of independent-minded, highly paid stars who are individually incented. Some investment banks often cross the line in our belief in terms of ethical behavior and often take excessive risk relative to the rewards. We predicted that six out of 10 of these investment bank acquisitions by commercial banks would not work. We were wrong. Nine out of 10 didn't work. <laughs> in fact, that's how we met, uh, missed the mess other large banks and investment banks are in right now. Management by culture told us that some of the actions taken by, by uh, others were morally and ethically wrong. Other act actions taken just did not make any risk-reward sense to us. Management by culture saved us. But things change. Because of these culture and ethical lapses, the investment banking industry has dramatically changed. With the recent demise of Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and, and uh, many smaller firms that, that actually left us in, 19, in the 1990s, there are only two broad product line investment banks left, namely Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and they are actually bank holding companies today. We believe that this radical industry realignment has permanently changed the competitive environment and, and business practices such that Wells Fargo can now be in the investment banking business without com compromising our culture and values. In combination with Wachovia, in, in just the past year, we have, and, and because of the uh, investment banking expertise that Wachovia had, we have gone from being a very small player to likely ranking in the top 10 of U.S. investment banks this year, and we think we'll be in the top five within the next few years. Our company's culture and belief in people as a competitive advantage also causes us to handle layoffs and staff reductions different from others. Now, we know it is often necessary because of acquisitions or other downsizing that positions must be el eliminated. But eliminating positions does not necessarily mean that good, loyal, experienced, and talented people need to be fired. When our competitors do acquisitions, they can hardly wait to tell the street how many people will be fired and what the cost savings will be. We, in contrast, don't typically do acquisitions for cost savings, but rather for revenue growth. Cost savings are usually a one-time profit gain. Revenue growth is the gift that keeps on giving. We do eliminate positions, but we attempt to find other jobs for the people being displaced. To find other jobs for the people being displaced, uh, given the turnover that exists in our company, there are literally thousands of positions available each year that can be filled by people displaced by acquisitions and downsiz downsizing. We call it retain and retrain. Since we believe in people as a competitive advantage, we want to keep all the good, experienced people that we can on our team. Another area we differ from other banks was our early commitment to and continued belief that we are a financial services company, much more than a bank. For over two decades now, less than 50% of our revenue comes from traditional banking. Traditional banking is about a $500 billion industry. The total financial services industry, which, in addition to banking, includes insurance, investment banking, asset management, mortgage, consumer finance, leasing, and other products, is a $2.7 trillion in size, over five times larger than banking. It is hard to grow when you have, uh, or, uh, excuse me, the leading bank in a given state may have 20% to 30% banking uh, uh, share in that state. It is hard to grow when you have such a large share. However, this banking share leader would usually have less than a 5% financial services market share in that state. That means there is plenty of room for growth if you were a financial services company. While others follow the advice of Wall Street, consulting firms, and conventional business school teaching of being st strategically focused, i.e. a narrow product line, and some were basically monolines, Wells Fargo has maintained a very broad product line delivering about every financial product and service purchased by mass market and high net worth consumers as well as large, medium, and small businesses. A lot of people, including some of my Stanford Business School professors, think you shouldn't try to be all things to all people. Admittedly, it is hard to do. But if you can figure out how to effectively deliver through cross-selling all the financial products needed by all the potential uh, customers in your marketplace, there are enormous competitive advantages, diversity of income streams, economics of scale and skill, and compelling profitability. Through my uh, positions on board of directors and, and the number of customer relationships that we have, 
I have helped uh, to nudge uh, other companies uh, to consider uh, expanding uh, their strategy and selling more products to their existing customers and more services, and it has also worked for them. It has always fascinated me that a multi-product financial company like Wells Fargo was considered by some as almost a conglomerate, uh, too broad and not focused. So, what I, so I had asked these people, is Walmart a conglomerate? Well, no, they would say. Are they focused? Absolutely, they, they are focused. Well, what does Walmart not sell? I try to get people to understand is that, is that um, uh, Wells Fargo is first and foremost a distributor. It's a distributor of commodity financial products. Most all financial products are, are similar. Thus, we have much more in common with other distributors of commodity products like Walmart and Lowe's than we did with Goldman Sachs or Countrywide. Just like Walmart and Lowe's, our, unique, our uniqueness is the way we distribute those products, not the products themselves. Consistent organic revenue growth through cross-selling is probably Wells Fargo's most distinctive skill. Our average retail household has 5.9 products and over one in four has over eight products. These are, are by far the highest cross-sell ratios, ratios in the industry and about twice the industry average. Our average wholesale customer has 6.4 products with us. Our middle market commercial banking division averages close to, to uh, 10 uh, uh, products per customer. Again, about double the industry average. Organic double-digit revenue growth is essential for consistent double-digit profit growth. We have grown our revenue at a double-digit uh, compound rate for 20 years and therefore our, we have had the profitability and market share growth that I've already mentioned to you. Uh, since many of, uh, of monolines have crashed and burned and, and, or been acquired, more company more companies now seem to be interested in cross-selling and broadening their product line. We have a 20-year head start on these Johnny-come-latelys, and I'm glad we do. Let me now mention the need for disciplined acquisitions. And this is required in any company in any in industry. I've never understood the comment, I know we paid a lot for this deal, but it is, but it is a strategic acquisition. If you paid so much that you don't get a decent return, what could be strategic about it? A strategic deal should mean that it fits so well is that you should make a pile of money. Let me ask you this about acquisition strategy. If you believe, as I do, that practically all financial segments, and it's true of many other industries, are cyclical, when during the cycle should you acquire? At the top or at the bottom? When do most people buy? I won't ask you how many get that question right. I'll leave that to your classroom. Most people only want to buy great companies, and so do we. But of course, they pay high premiums. Wells Fargo often buys fixer-uppers, companies who have had a temporary setback but still have good people and good customers and a solid franchise. We pay a lower price because there is more work to do, which will require more time and perhaps additional investment. But with our broad product line, our superior business model, our strong and experienced management team, and our cross-selling prowess, we can, usually within three years, get the troubled company growing revenue at double-digit rates, just like the rest of our company. A good example of this strategy the guard mentioned was the acquisition of Wachovia Bank last fall for $12.7 billion, a company whose market cap was over $90 billion a couple years before that and has the number one banking market share in eight fast-growing southeastern states as well as other great markets. Yes, we have some problems to fix, but I believe this will turn out to be the best and most profitable acquisition in banking, in, in banking history and among the best in all of corporate history. We also uh, often buy smaller companies rather than larger companies because their culture is more similar to ours. The implementation risks are less, and so is the risk of being wrong. Most of our large bank competitors buy only large companies. When we do a deal, the financial projections must clear two hurdles, a minimum 15% internal rate of return and accretive to existing stockholders by no later than year three. Both are important. If you have a PE ratio higher than your acquisition target, it is relatively easy to be accretive, but there is usually a reason for the PE difference. 
the target has probably been growing at a slower rate. If you give the sellers most of your P.E. difference, you will soon grow more slowly as well. Your P.E. will fall. Requiring both an IRR and an accretive hurdle rate ensures you only do deals that will add value no matter how you elect to pay for them, stack, stock, cash, or a combination of both. Most companies don't do that. Some companies set their IRR hurdle rate too low, in my opinion, at their so-called cost of capital, something they probably learned in business school, as I did. Who wants to earn only their cost of capital? That's a sure step toward mediocrity. Others think any acquisition that is accretive is, is good without considering the inherent PE differences. <coughs> Let me ask you this question. Should you take actions based upon the advice of so-called industry uh, uh, visionaries, pundits, the media, and Wall Street experts? When I first started running major banking businesses in the late 90, 1970s, I was told by, 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 by my boss that branches were dead and paper checks were history. We should start reducing both immediately. While there are more branches today than there have ever been, and they increase every year, only in the past couple years, uh, 35 years later, are we seeing paper checks decline. In the 1980s, I was told that the mortgage business is a lousy business and we should get out of it. In the early 1990s, I was told that banking margins were falling so rapidly and non-bank competitors were growing market share so fast that banking was all about cutting costs. The cost cutters would ultimately win. In the late 1990s, I was told that the internet would make, make uh, branches obsolete. Bill Gates said banks were dinosaurs. By the early 2000s, everything was reversed. It was now all about revenue growth, not cost cut. Uh, I was also told branches were now so valuable we should open them by the thousands. As we know, those visionaries were consistently wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to listen to the futurists, the pundits, the media, and Wall Street because there is usually some rationale to their positions. But in my opinion, don't do anything until you see signs that customers are actually voting with their feet. Look for the earliest possible signs of radical change. If you don't see any, stay away from the bleeding edge. And uh, the customers, I said, use your feet. Don't look at eyeballs as a reason for uh, market uh, valuations. Contrary to the industry, we've been opening new stores and acquiring stores through acquisitions at the same pace practically for two decades. We are continuing to do so. We never stopped or restarted, and we have always focused on revenue over cost cutting. We also developed what is now considered the best integrated internet banking channel in the industry, and it serves all of our customers' personal business and investment needs through one single sign-on, whether that person enters for their personal accounts, their business accounts, or their wealth management account. Customers can navigate from one to the other easily and efficiently. Global Finance Magazine just rated our internet offering as the best in the world. During the internet glory days, unlike the pundits, uh, and consulting companies and many of our competitors, we never saw the internet as a competing channel. We saw it as complementing our other distribution channels. Uh, and, and, and the vast majority of all our, of our customers are actually multi-channel users. They use our stores, the internet, the ATMs, and the telephone. We never saw nor expected customers to suddenly stop using their primary channel and immediately go exclusively to a new channel. We believe if they did begin to shift, they, wouldn't, they would shift gradually and such a moder and such a moderate pace that we could reconfigure our distribution network accordingly. Many of our competitors during the internet craze closed their branches in anticipation of a major change in, consumer, in customer behavior and then reversed all of that a few years later. Let me now mention scale versus skill. How many times do you hear a CEO say, I need to get bigger to be better? I don't buy that. You get bigger by being better. You don't get better by being bigger. Scale is certainly important in some business, but is often overrated. For example, in, in banking, I would say over $100 billion in assets or so, skill is much more important than scale. Skill is finding the best way to do something in one place, say a store or with a customer, and then replicating that over your entire network. That's the only advantage to me of being big. You get to take a good idea and multiply it thousands of times versus maybe less than 100 times for a smaller company. Otherwise, size can be a deterrent to organic growth. Why? 
because you often lose touch with your customers and team members. Bureaucracy sets in, hierarchy rules, you lose speed to market and fast decision making. How about risk management? Well, you can't be considered the best financial services company in, in the industry unless you're the best at managing risk. Risk of all forms, credit risk, interest rate risk, and operational risk. All segments of the financial services industry are cyclical and it's quite common that towards the end of the positive side of the cycle, asset values get elevated and risk spreads decline to a level beyond, and in some cases far beyond, their fundamentals. Only if you are disciplined, diversified, and have skilled and experienced managers and leaders that have reduced, that have reduced your exposure to such overvaluations can you avoid the write-downs as these assets are eventually valued significantly low, uh, uh, lower. We only have to look at what happened in late 2007 when the collapse of the subprime mortgage market set off a reevaluation of all asset classes and led to a rather extended credit crunch. We bankers just don't get it. Every decade or so, we have to relearn that covenants are important, that risks do go up and down but never disappear, that the greater fool theory, now known as securitizations, collateral debt obligations, and the like, do not last long, and that sooner, but most often, later, it will all come back to roost. Wells Fargo, by the way, did not participate in this charade. Our responsible lending values that are included in our vision and values uh, booklet saved us. We did not offer any no-doc option or negative amortization loans to subprime borrowers. These exotic subprime mortgage loans were not only economically unsound, they were not appropriate for many borrowers. We lost 4% market share in our mortgage business for three years between 2005 and 2007, $160 billion in originations in 2006 alone. In hindsight, we were glad we did. For similar reasons, we also did not participate to any significant degree in the, late, in the latest Wall, Wall Street fads, such as collateral debt obligations, structured investment vehicles to hold assets uh, off uh, balance sheets, hedge fund financing, uh, off balance sheet conduits, low covenant or no covenant large highly leveraged uh, loans. Uh, we do not hold in our money market mutual funds any collateralized debt obligations, any commercial paper obligations directly backed by subprime debt, and so on and so on. Another area we seem to do things differently from others is management succession in general and CEO succession in particular. Years ago at NOROWEST, we put in a policy that all members of the management committee, it's the top 50 or so people in our company, um, had to retire uh, not later than the end of the year that they became 65. Now, this was not done because we think people over 65 cannot continue to contribute to corporations. It was done for succession planning purposes. It takes many years to prepare someone to take over senior positions at a company the size and complexity of Wells Fargo. For senior positions, it may take three to five years. For CEO position, even longer. The 65 and year out policy was put in place to ensure that everyone, including the board, knew there was a time certain that someone would retire, and so plans could be made to select the best candidates and give them the necessary experience to handle the new job. So we ask all committee members to give us a minimum of two years' notice. And, and, and so this, this 65 and year out policy is really something more akin to a term limit and ensures that there will be a well-timed process to select the best placement and the replacement candidate would also know approximately when the position would be available. It could be sooner, but it would not be later than that date. And that's how we handled CEO succession at, at Wells Fargo. I don't think the old CEO should stay beyond 65 to play the role of coach. Uh, as uh, the new CEO is, so, is selected, about 18 to months to two years uh, before becomes CEO, and uh, the uh, old CEO becomes chairman and it helps coach the succession process. I think the old CEO should give up his CEO role in, in that two-year period and remain a full-time chairman until uh, his age of 65 expires. Now, Wells Fargo followed this process with, uh, with our CEO succession. And in fact, the CEO succession started about seven years uh, before John Stump was selected in July of uh, 2007. By the way, uh, I w would have retired uh, at the end of last year, but because we acquired Wachovia and because of the financial crisis, I was asked to stay on for a, uh, an extra year to help integrate uh, the acquisition and, and help with the crisis. Um, let me conclude by asking you this question. 
What is the most important metric in business? If you had to pick only one metric to evaluate how well a company is performing and how likely it would perform in the future, what would that be? If I have learned anything over the past 40 years, it is this. The key to the bottom line is actually the top line. The only way to consistently grow profits is to consistently grow organic risk-adjusted revenue. If customers are giving you more of their business as evidenced by organic revenue growth, you know you must be doing a lot of things right. You must have competitive products. You must have good service. You must have good people who understand customers' needs. You must be priced about right. Your technology must be competitive. The opposite is also true. If you're not generating organic revenue, you have major problems. Uh, you have major problems. Cutting costs only lasts for so long and will probably even reduce future revenue. Financial engineering is more often a long-term negative than a positive. If you believe that revenue is the key metric, then as CEO, you must lead by example. You must be customer focused, call on customers, make sales calls with team members, and walk the talk. I have probably made an average of two customer calls or customer visits every day in my business career. I don't ever remember that being considered important when I was at the Stanford Business School. Acquisitions that grow revenue after being acquired can never be good investments for very long. In my opinion, revenue growth is so important that you shouldn't even make an acquisition unless the revenue growth of the combined enterprise is higher than the sum of the revenue growth of the two companies if they had remained separate entities. So in my opinion, it's all about organic risk-adjusted revenue growth year after year after year. By the way, we have been, Wells Fargo has been growing revenue at double digit rates for 20 years, 12% annual compound rate, for example. So it's it has indeed been quite a story and quite a journey. It is really a story of the opportunity presented by capitalism and the free enterprise system. It's amazing what opportunities are out there. Speaking of capitalism, I thought you'd like to know my definition of capitalism and how it differs from other political and economic systems. It is particularly relevant given what's going on in Washington today. First, socialism. That's when you have two cows and the government gives one to your neighbor. <laughs> Communism. That's when you have two cows, you had to give both to the government, and the government distributes half the milk to the people and the other half spoils on the way to being delivered. <laughs> Fascism. That's when you have two cows, you have to give all the milk to the government officials. The officials sell the milk and deposit the proceeds in their Swiss bank account. And then there's capitalism. You have two cows, you sell one of them, and you buy a bull. <laughs> That's capitalism. <laughs> if I have learned anything in my 42 years of business, it is this. Success without fun never lasts. Fun without success isn't much fun. My wish for all of you is to have both fun and success in your business career. Thank you for inviting me back to my roots. I wish all of you the best in your career and you have as much fun as I've had in mine. I'd now be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. your talk. Um, I read a quote from Alan Greenspan nine months or so ago where he said if he were 50 years younger he'd start a bank and wondering if you agree with that sentiment and if you do how that might apply to someone in our shoes that's going out into the working world. Well uh, I don't know about uh, starting a bank because it's you know it's a difficult thing to do and it takes time and a lot of capital to proceed but I, I think it's a financial services business and that's why I'll change the word from bank to financial is, is one of the great industries in, in the world you know money never declines. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it grows forever and we're, you're basically in the money business if you're in financial services. And so you have an industry that's, that's always going up and there's uh, not many of that. You know, you can have too much food, you can have too much wine, but I don't know of anyone who has too much money. <laughs> so I think it's a great business. You mentioned your business units were all very decentralized. How, how did you leverage the, I guess, the uh, integrated side of things? So how did you 
manage your business units so they were integrated while being yeah. also decentralized? It's really our, our secret sauce. You know, we operate these in, in, uh, decentralized businesses, but from a customer standpoint, we hope to be viewed as one Wells Fargo. So we, we partner uh, uh, between the businesses so that we can deliver all the various products and services that these decentralized companies are manufacturing as one to the customer. It's a very difficult process. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of all explained in our vision and values, but it's, it really, uh, you have to completely organize your company from your technology to your incentive systems to your structure to your reward and recognition uh, system that encourages this, be this behavior. And uh, it's, li it's literally hundreds of small things that make that happen. And uh, the way I explain this is the, is the bad news is this is hard to do. The good news is this is hard to do. And it's a little bit like Walmart. Does anyone not know what, what Walmart's strategy is? I mean, everyone knows it. Well, you know, low cost, et cetera. But it's, it's how they do that strategy that nobody can duplicate. And it's a bit like ours. Everyone sees the benefit of cross-selling now, but it's very hard to do. So your competitive advantage is it's a superior, superior business model. A superior business model that's easy doesn't stay superior for long. A bad business model that's hard is, of course, the worst thing you can do. <laughs> but a superior business model that's hard to do actually is the upper right-hand corner. You can, you can have a competitive advantage for a long time if it's a superior business model and hard. Um, just had a quick question. Um, you know, City had already bid for Vacovia, so what was, there's a lot of coverage in the press, but what was like the thought process? Um, to, what the what process? Uh, well, like, you know, uh, bidding for Vacovia when City had already done so, and when the stock hit $7.80 or around that figure, did you ever think that it was a bad move, you know, back in March? Well, uh, no. Uh, I guess is the short answer. Uh, uh, you know, it, it gets back to what I was trying to say before. You know, the, the conventional was, in my experience, uh, if, if you only had two choices to make, follow the conventional wisdom or do the opposite, if you did the opposite, you would be better off. Now, I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying the conventional wisdom is wrong, in my opinion, so much of the time. Now, but again, I don't, you got to pay attention to it. Because it, you know, there's usually some truth to it, but you, you just have to have the, your own conviction. Come to the, your own conclusion. Do that quantitative analysis. Listen to your people. Uh, uh, forget ego. Do the right thing. And usually, it will be opposite or, or different from the conventional wisdom. And that's how you do things. You know, again, when do you buy? You buy when things are great or when things are in trouble. And when do people buy? I mean, this is not hard. If you have a cyclical business, if you just buy it here <laughs> and perform on average, you're going to perform a lot better than if you buy it up here and, and, and it's cyclical. And most all businesses are cyclical. So it's things like that. And so our market share and our acquisition strategy has always been greater in, by a huge degree in the so-called bad times. So you talked a lot about acquisitions and culture. How would you characterize the difference between Wachovia's culture and, and Wells Fargo's? And what have you done to really sort of uh, blend the two cultures together to have a cohesive unit? Yeah, uh, the, the, the basic part, what, the problem that happened with Wachovia is they started out as a, as a regional bank uh, and made a lot of acquisitions where the theory was, and the former CEO uh, at Crutchfield basically said, it, I've got to get uh, bigger to be better. <laughs> and that's, as I said earlier in my speech, that's, that's very dangerous. And he bought things at very high prices and got into problems. So then they had to cut costs. And then he decided to go into brand, brand new businesses uh, because they uh, were fairly narrowly focused, saw the benefits of diversity a little late, and thought they had to catch up. And so they went into investment banking. They, uh, went into the mortgage business uh, at the peak of the cycle. And, and so what happened is they had some, a lot of problems that were caused by the 
imp uh, failed implementation of a strategy. But the fundamental businesses were actually quite strong. But they were being masked by the mistakes they made by going into investment banking and trading, by going into pick a pay and the savings uh, business. They paid way overpaid for certain acquisitions and had to make that up through cost cutting and so on. And we know what happened. And well, all we've done is sliced off all the bad things. We don't do the things that got them into trouble. Uh, we uh, are paying part of the purchase price of, of the difference between 90 billion and 12.7 is writing off all the problems in their pick a pay portfolio. But the underlying people are very culturally similar. The businesses are very similar. And um, uh, we will, this will turn out to be the best deal ever done in banking. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my question is, you mentioned earlier that you have uh, a very keen focus on revenue growth, and you also mentioned that you guys are expanding your other business lines, such as investment banking. But actually, those two things in combination, many people said over the last five years are precisely what led us into the crisis today, because retail banks were focusing on growing their revenue, diversifying all their risk on Wall Street, and um, that's kind of how we ended up in the situation we had last year. So. How do you feel as a bank you guys can move forward with those two things in mind and, and not face whatever the next crisis may be? Well, as I said, uh, is that I think that the cultures that existed back then, uh, we wouldn't have gone into investment banking. Uh, that has changed. Now, when I talk about investment banking, I'm really talking about the meat and potatoes of investment banking, you know, underwriting <laughs> debt and equity and so on. We, don't, we, we did not do and will not do the trading activities, the CDOs, the structured products. Uh, they didn't make any sense anyway. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but the, we could even be in the basic part of investment banking because of the cultures that exist, but it's all gone now. And so uh, uh, today, uh, we think, as I said, we, we're probably in the top 10 now, we'll be in the top five. Now, if that culture changes back to the old way, uh, we will just wind that business down if we can't compete. I don't see that happening. I think this is a, a fundamental change that's going to be around, if not forever, for at least 10 years. Uh, and uh, if anything, I think uh, the industry will move even closer to you know, a culture like Wells Fargo than it even is today. And, and if one reason that will occur is I think you're going to have uh, close watch by regulators in this industry for a long time. And even if they wanted to, they're not going to be allowed to do it other than going into an unregulated hedge fund or, or whatever, but it's not going to be done uh, uh, through an investment banking environment, in my opinion. We'll see. <laughs> I worked at Perella Weinberg, which advised, uh, was an advisor in the Wachovia Wachovia Wells Fargo transaction, uh, and you guys really have something unique. Uh, and you spoke about choosing people was your key role. I was just wondering if you could offer some advice as far as when you're choosing people, what to, what were the key components, or any advice related to that. Well, I, I say, say that most of our our senior people are homegrown. We like to get bring people in early in their life, experience the culture. Uh, see the most successful ones and promote them, uh, etc. Uh, uh, but we do the most of the outside people we bring in are through acquisitions. So again, we get them. We we don't bring a lot of people in that haven't been uh, that get into senior positions that haven't been with us for at least ten years. So it's kind of homegrown, is how we do that. And uh, and we get we want people who have great values, who are smart, but but do believe in this t in teamwork. And, and really caring about customers and their communities and so forth. And we think that's more important, as I said, than, than brains at the 99% level. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great.